Hi everybody, Will Alexander from Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips. This week on the interview chair we have Leslie Potts. You know this is going to be a good interview. Hi everybody! Today at the show, we in the interview chair. We have none other than Leslie Potts. Hi, Les. How are you? Hi, Will. How you doing? I'm good. Great to see you. I haven't seen you in ages. I haven't seen you in ages. I almost said something rude just then. I haven't felt you in ages either. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stop, William. Don't stop. Okay, we have to get serious here. This is a serious show. Yes, <laughs> I know. I understand that. Okay. Let's start at the beginning. Tell me how you got involved in dogs, but tell me how old you were first before you, before you start. How old you? I was born practically in the kennel. I mean, almost born in the kennel. Um, I went a little bit early and my mother was in the kennel. So um, I come from the northeast of England, a little town called Cramlington. And my mother's a judge and a breeder. And um, we started in Collies and Shelties. And she was very good friends with Tom Purvis and... Elmer Robinson, Bobby James, Anne Knight, um, Reg Gadsden. So I grew up around Joe Braddon, all of those people wow. in championship shows. And I got my first whippet um, from Anne Knight. She came on a train from Leeds in a little wooden box. And there was a note attached to it that just said, if you don't like it, put it on the next train back. <laughs> Well, we opened it up and there she was, a little fawn and white, eight week old whippet puppy with giant black eyes. And that was it. That started us in whippets and slowly but surely no more shelties and collies. And we were overrun with whippets. So and it's still my passion today. I love my whippets. So how old were you when you switched to whippets then? Seven, seven, seven years old. And, and I'm not telling you how old I am now. Well, seven minus 29 years. Oh, thank you. Bro. <laughs> I didn't mean in it that long. <laughs> um, so you've got the whippets now. Tell me about that. What's, what, what happened after that? You started whippets. You've got the one. Um, you know, as I said, my mother was always really active at the shows and socially. It was all her life was dogs and dog people. Um, so obviously I started to go to the shows. And um, we used to go on the dog buses. You used to book a seat for yourself and your dog. Wow. And you'd get up in the middle of the night and meet them at a service area. And there'd be Great Danes in the back. And there'd be Daxons up front, depending on which day you were going to the championship show. Or I used to go with a good friend of my mother's, Alan Freethy. And we, he had Afghans. And um, he was an amazing, amazing guy, but he worked for a dry cleaners. So when you went in Alan's van, you were pretty compromised by the time you got to the show from the chemicals in the van. <laughs> so, and the whippets were pretty compromised too, but um, it was always a lot of fun. And I did that until I was 16. I was fairly successful in juniors. I won at Richmond one year. I put a reserve ticket on my mother's Denorsi bitch, which was Jack Pedden and um, Jack Nichols co-bred her. She was from an international champion. Denorsi quick match at Glenn Burby, who was a beautiful bitch. So I've been really fortunate to be around some really great kennels when the, you know we had big breeding kennels and amazing dog people. I really have. So, and then I came here in 1981 um, to work for that? Sporting Fields. I was 16. <laughs> I graduated high school on a Tuesday and I got on the plane on a Thursday wow. with 60 bucks in a suitcase. Oh my. <laughs> a one way ticket. And the butler picked me up at Philadelphia International Airport from Sporting Fields Kennels from Jim and Donnie Butt. And he drove me out to the Pennsylvania Turnpike where I hopped on their Bluebird dog bus full of whippets and we went to a dog show. Right away. Into the right away. And Tipton was judging and I put a five point major on a whippet. 
And I still remember the Whippet's name, Usher Sunkissed, Sonny. That was my first weekend at dog shows in the States. The only problem was I didn't know how to eat anything. I didn't know what any of the food was. Oh, what did you I just eat? ate Oreo cookies and drank milk for the first week I was here. <laughs> Were you overwhelmed by it all? Or you- I was, and I was overwhelmed by Jim and Donnie, and I didn't realize until years later Donnie couldn't understand a word I said. So she just <laughs> said yes to everything. So, and believe it or not, I was very shy and quiet back then. No way. When I arrived off the plane, yes, I was. And then, you know, eventually I got introduced to Debbie and I was there for six years. Wow, so, cool. yeah, you know, I had a good introduction and good teachers, good mentors. Debbie showed me more finesse in the ring. Um, you know, I came with a lot of raw talent and a lot of dog sense, but I didn't have the finesse that you have here in America for showing the dogs. Um, didn't realize there was so much into clothes and, you know, being fancy, as I called it back then. Very fancy. It's very fancy over here, mom. Um, but Debbie showed me a lot and, you know, she's still like my sister to me. I owe her a lot. There's no doubt about it. Um, and then I went on and worked for Mike Zolo, which That's I can tell you some stories. We met yeah. with Michael. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Loved Michael dearly. Loved him with a passion. Tell me about that. Tell me about work. You don't have to get into all the stories, but I want to right. hear some of them. <laughs> um, I remember one year we went out to Detroit when they had the um, competition of champions. Do you remember what was it? I am. So you can remember that. Put it on. And we had Debbie and B with us. And he was doing the breeders competition and I had to hold B and she was a swine to hold because all she wanted was Michael. And she could be a little sharp around the edges if she didn't get her own way. Well, she jumped up on me and ripped all the buttons off my black suit dress from the top to the (laughs) bottom. And I flashed the security guard, thanks to B. There was a lot of safety pins in my dress that night. But, and then there's lots more stories, but, uh, you know, we traveled a lot. I met a great, I met Frank Sabella through Michael and Max Magda and, you know, the list goes on. Yeah. So. What great times though. Wow. Oh, it, it was fantastic. Yeah. We, we got into a lot of time. trouble too, but came it to was look, fantastic. Colin and I came up to, came down to look at, uh, I think it was a it was a bee's litter we came to look at. It could have been. Was it in Bernardsville, in New Jersey, <laughs> no, or were we, we in Elkton back then, in Maryland? Maryland. We were in Maryland. We were in Elkton then. Yeah. Yeah. I saw. I, I see. Michael showed but me that, Panky and I forget what other dogs. I well, Blake was Panky. there. Blake was there at the time. The big orange and white dog. Yeah. Um and um Booker. Yeah, a very controversial dog. He would have been there then. Yeah. Um, but boy, they were some beautiful pointers. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. I remember. I, I was looking at. Do you remember Hanky Panky? Remember that? Oh yeah. That dog, yeah. Just, because of his headpiece, it just sticks in my head. You know, head. Yeah. Michael was showing them to me, and I, he's got this headpiece on. I'm like, oh my God. You know? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. He had some beautiful pointers. I mean, there's no doubt about it. How long were you there with Michael? On and off, probably for about nine years. Um, I worked for Stebbins for a little while, Bobby Stebbins and Linda. All right. <laughs> yeah, we must have been at opposite ends of that. It wasn't very long. I think it was about a year, but got goldened out. Definitely yep. got my fill of goldens. And she had that Tibetan at the time for Sue Carr, Mickey. Oh, the yeah. little black and white bitch that she did all the winning with. But, um, and then I went back to Michael's and when Michael got sick, I stayed with him. Okay. Um, so that was a sad part of my life. Oh my God. You know? it was sad for all. Very, very sad to lose him. He was, I remember he was, I guess he was top dog with bees in, was it 87 he was top dog with I bees? think it was 87, yeah. yeah. I think I was top dog up here the same year with Iris Setter. And we met uh-huh. somewhere, and that's why we, I think we had dinner because of that. I forget now, but it was, right. it was so much fun. It was so much fun. Oh, he was great company. He definitely was. Everybody adored Michael. Yep, yep. 
So after after Michael, um, where did you go from there? Um, after Michael, like I said, I dotted around a little bit. Um, I, I worked for Linda and Bobby for a little while, and then I I worked for Fowler for Bobby Fowler for a while, okay. which is how I was introduced to Mrs. Robeson who I didn't know had the first top 20 winner at the AWC that Andy Linton showed. Saxon Show Flashback was her name. And when I started to work for Bobby with mainly the Dark Sons, I became friends with Mrs. Robeson and obviously the Whippet connection was there. And I started to work for her and I worked for her for about 12 years until her death. And um, she, I was fortunate enough that she left me her kennel name Albalorm, which I gave my kennel name Falconeer to my daughter, and I've continued on Albalorm since then. Okay. And obviously, still we breed the whippets, and she's always in my thoughts. And lately, I am lucky enough to have a really, really close relationship with Carol Harris of Bobet's Whippets, who was Isabel's best friend growing up. Wow. Um, they went to school together, they went to horse shows together, they went to dog shows. So we have that in common. And now I have some Bobette dogs here and we have Bobette Albalom dogs. <laughs> so it's all come kind of full circle. Big, big circle. You know, but um, yeah. And, you know, once um, Isabel passed away, then I really, I'd always worked more privately for a kennel, you know, for sporting fields, for Albalom, than I ever had worked for myself. So, you know, when Isabel died, I branched out and um, took on a lot more different hounds and Dalmatians. I've shown Dalmatians now for about 20 some years for one breeder in New York, lots of spots. Um, finished all of her champions for the last 20 some years. It's only a couple of year, but they're wonderful people, small breeding program. And obviously I continue on the whippets and show for a lot of different whippet breeders. You gotta love and that. greyhounds. You gotta and love the that penalty about they stayed with you for 29 years. That's, uh, you gotta love that. Oh, I do. I mean, the loyalty in this business, when it's real, it really is. And we're fortunate to have it, you know, come thick or thin, because obviously you have some bad days with them. And sometimes the dogs aren't as good as the one maybe you've had before. But, you know, when you've got that kind of loyalty and, you know, you've worked with somebody for that long, it really is something special. I, I believe that, too. Yeah, like showing generation after generation of somebody's heart. Ken, really, yeah. Yes. And it's, it's, I, I've done it as well. And it's, it's, it's very gratifying. So. It's very rewarding. I agree. Definitely. So you're, you and I, you're on your own, obviously. Um, mentors, we did, we, you did touch on a few. Um, anyone you haven't talked about? Anyone that really had a, a big impact on you, Les? Oh, I'm sure all, um, but. I would say probably Frank Sabella and Max Magdor. No, um, really? I had a great relationship with Max and, you know, I met Frank through Michael, but Max and Frank were really good friends when they were really good friends. Sometimes they weren't really good friends. <laughs> you know how that would go with those two. I'm sure you do. Um, and, you know, I, I was lucky. They were really forthcoming with me. Um, and I don't think I, I, when somebody tries to give me advice, I don't take it as criticism. So I'm always really open to learn. And Frank, from the handling aspect, was incredible. You sure was. You know, his vision of how you could put a dog together has stayed with me for a very long time. You know, he said, you need to get an image in your head, you know, and, and then you make the dog look like that. And it, it was lost on me for the longest time. I mean, you've obviously got to have the kind of dog that you can shape into that image. But a lot of it he was saying was it's knowledge in the breed. You know, doesn't matter what you pick up ringside, read the standard, take care of business, you know, understand your breed. And, you know, and he understood temperaments and he understood horses, dogs, people. So I was really fortunate there. Max was a great breeder. He had a great eye for putting dogs together. So I got to learn a lot on the breeding aspect from Max too. But there's been a lot of important people, I think just in Whippet Breeds on a whole that maybe it hasn't been a long relationship, but you know, Sporting Fields obviously had a great, great impact on me. 
Um, I admire other breeders tremendously, even if they don't have the style of dog I like, like Plum Creek with Linda Lawson. I'm lucky to be able to reach out to her. Um, there's lots I could go on and on and on, but I would say, you know, Michael had a great impact on me. He was a great handler as well as a great breeder. So lots of people. Fowler, I learned a lot from Fowler. I learned a lot about business from Fowler. Really? He was a good important. businessman. That's really important. That was and, you know, I'm not so good at that. And I wasn't so good at that. You know, the passion drove me, not the business or the money yeah. end of it. Exactly. And at some point you have to get sensible. <laughs> you know, I don't find that so easy. No, I get that. I remember when when Allison and I first got together, she thought I I just showed dogs for cigarettes and hockey tickets. <laughs> <laughs> you did, didn't you? <laughs> Excellent. Isn't that awful. <laughs> it, it's so funny when you, when you spoke about Max. It was I, I really wish I had interviewed Max because he had so much to offer, and he had so many breeds he was so impactful on. He was. He had a great, you know, I should mention the Greyhounds was the biggest impact yeah. he had on me. <clears throat> the, and, you know, I was fortunate to show for him. Yes. To show did. some of those beautiful dogs. They were beautiful. I would go oh. there. I mean, I, Queenie, I think her name was. Yes. And to die for. When she was young, because I, I went over there and I was honest with him. I said, I have a real issue. I, I need you to explain the underline to me. I need to know all that. And he was right. so great about it. And he would bring these dogs out for me. And he'd look at her like a mess, right? Yep. I would love him to he'd get Paul to run out and then he would shout instructions at the dog, stand, stand. <laughs> I showed a griff for him. I mean, he had griffs too. He had nice griffs too. Yeah. I showed a griff for him and he was Melody Griffon. <laughs> <laughs> Melody Griffon. Yeah. He was so fun to show for. And he was so, he, he just, he was, he was impactful in English setters. He was impactful in, Pekingese. He was just an right. guy. Just, we really missed him he up here. Was, his life was like that, you know. I think because of the design experience, um, you know, the way he had traveled, I think he was like a sponge for taking in information all over the world. And he could relay things to you in a way you could understand. Oh, he well, really could. Even, even like, uh, even breeds I thought I knew well enough. He taught me things about them. He was, I, I, I got, I've got off topic here, but I just, Max was a soft spot up here he, for us all. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> More mentors? What other mentors did you have, Les? You must have, even. Um, in I would say, you know, later in life, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you remember back when I first got here, we really never went home. We went from dog show to dog show, stopped in at the kennel, changed dogs, you know, and went from dog show to dog show to dog show. Um, and when I found a good relationship with somebody, I stayed with somebody for, you know, a number of years usually. Um, so, you know, I've mentioned a few. I would say, you know, I always admired Bob and Jim Forsyth, obviously, and I was lucky enough. I knew Bob better than I knew Jane because of sporting fields. And Jane actually terrified me. So, <laughs> you know, and Annie Clark ter terrified me. But I was fortunate enough that, you know, they would have something to say if I was doing the wrong thing with a dog or needed some input or I had one that was doing well that maybe they didn't think was that great. You know, they could tell me why. And, you know, it kind of brought you down to humbling, down to ground. Oh, nice. um, but, I mean, a lot of people, I watch people, like Terry Hunt. I mean, I wouldn't say we were close friends ever, but I admired Terry in the ring with that Doberman bitch in the 80s that she did all the winning with. And right now, I can't remember her name. Well, her and so, Bob were quite close, so we got to see. I got to, like, I well, always... Bob, got... Mary, and Daglia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bob and Daglia, I mean, I've worked for them. Um, Mary's still on all of the dogs. Um, you know, even though Bob's out of judging now, Mary Cohn's dogs with me and Cole Breed's dogs. With oh, that's talking about Bobby Stebbins. Like, that's how I first Oh, Bob Stebbins, yeah. Yeah, that's how I first met. Yeah, but I forgot to mention Bob and Daglia, though. You know, as so I've worked for them, and I still Cohn and, and work for Mary. So, um, Stebbins was like an uh, uh, enigma to me. You know, he 
he was larger than life in some ways and quiet and um I don't know what the word is I'm looking for. He was very kind to me. Mm -hmm. Just very, very kind. He expected you to work hard and do a good job. You know, um, I think Linda wore the pants in that family, but, um, <laughs> you know, um, but I enjoyed my time with Bobby and Linda. There's no doubt about it. And thought about the sporting aspect of things, but I always end up back with the sight hounds. It's, it really is what I enjoy. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed working for Bob and Linda too. And I just how long did you work for Bob and Linda? Only like for not very long, not even not a full year. Um, yeah, yeah, it was, was kind of the same for, for me. I was back right. in Canada, but he they did teach me a lot. I'll tell you, Bobby was really good about if I had a break in the schedule, he would send me to go watch people, and more times than right. not, he would send me to go watch Gene Blake. Like it was. Yeah, he he really he was really good that way. He said, "Oh, sporting, you watch me." But he said, yeah. <laughs> "Right, right, that would be Bob." Yeah, absolutely. Uh, watch really me that way. And, he, and if I had any questions, and if I wanted to meet anybody, he like he he took me over to meet Dick Cooper when when I was like, I I, I was in awe. Of, I knew him, but I was in awe. Of right. Him. Was he showing all the polk fox sounds back then? Uh, well, I knew him mostly for the Springers and the Irish Setters. For the Springers, okay. Um, and, and this was near when I first, when I first finally physically met the guy was, he was later on in his career, but it was, uh -huh. still, it was still exciting to meet him. And Bobby just marched me over there and said, Dick, I want you to meet this young man. Right. <laughs> so it was, yep. I, I really, I, I, I wish I'd worked longer for them because I think I would have learned a lot. He was, he, right. was, he was actually a good teacher. He really was. Yeah. Like I said, he was very, very kind to me. I said, he expected you to work hard and listen and, you know, and I remember that about him. I was always a stalker at the dog shows when I, for at least the first 20 years I was here, I would find people that I love to watch showing dogs or breeds. I love a beautiful Doberman bitch. I love a beautiful standard poodle bitch. I still to this day go watch standard poodles and Dobermans. Shepherds, you know, I, I got to know Ken Rayner and I know Sue, who's now Sue Reed. They're really good friends of mine. So I had a stint in Shepherds for a while, but that was a little too much for me. A little too much. I love watching them. I, I never. Oh, I do too. Five. I would love to go to the national. <laughs> oh yeah. Love to go. Well, I don't know have Lenny have le has legs left anymore. Oh, uh, every year before the Canadian national up here, they they would all show up here a couple of shows before, like Jimmy and and they'd all be here. The Shepherd competition would be crazy for two weeks before the national. Right. But it'd be so much fun watching them. Oh, my God. You know? Oh, I don't know how they do it. Yeah, it's amazing. So, you know, and I, and I still, when I get time, do that. You know, I'll yeah. still go to a ring and watch. You yeah. never stop learning. Oh, exactly. You can't stop learning. No, you, 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 there's no off button. And I, you know, and I would like to think I've become more open-minded in style. I hate saying types of dogs because we have a standard which gives us a type. So I styles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. because it's interpretive you know everybody gets something That's different out of reading the same book so everybody's vision is a little different you know but you can make it adhere to the standard so i prefer to say styles and i i've definitely become more open-minded as the longer i've bred um you know to admire good things in other people's dogs even if they're not my style mm -hmm. you know and you, you stay a good breeder that way and a good handler, too. And I'm hoping to be a good judge one day, oh, you, you know. Are. So, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to that aspect of my life. That brings me to the next question that we were talking about different dogs and whatnot. I want to know what dogs are in your mind's eye. And try not to talk about dogs that are being shown now, but dogs right. you've seen that you, that you either just loved watching or you wish you could have been a part of or wish you could have shown, you know? Um, I would have loved to have shown the whippet bitch of the butts, the tawny bitch, Sporting Fields Bahama Breeze. She, to me, was the epitome of a whippet. Um, I would have loved to have owned her, co-owned her, had a foot. I mean, it didn't really matter. To this day, she still gives me goosebumps. Um, and then Froggy of Terry Hunts, the deerhound bitch, you know, I was lucky enough to show this with Glenn Margot, but I remember seeing Froggy, who was a big bitch like Margot, 
And I just remember melting when I watched that bitch go around the ring. Um, there's been quite a few Doberman bitches, Chili. I would have loved to have had the chance just to take her in a ring once. You know, she was beautiful. Um, lots of pointers, I, you know, because of Michael, I would have loved to have a chance. I did take bees in once and she chewed me out and spit me out. <laughs> um, that wasn't pretty, but I, I showed a lot of Michael's pointers. Um, I think IG's Carol Harris's real dog, um, the one that Davin showed, and oh, Mary Dukes's Stephen dog, the black dog. I love those two. Very, they were slightly different, but I would have loved an opportunity to show them. Um, oh, there's probably lots if I thought about it some more. You know, I'm sure you feel the same way. You know, we really had some great ones. Is there is there one that was like I like I my breed is obviously Irish setters, and well, obviously, but I I grew up in Irish setters. And I always have, I have a couple of dogs that are like trademarks in my head that changed my way of thinking about them. You have right. those breed, those dogs in your head. Yeah. I mean, like I said, Tawny, the Bahama breeze bitch and whippets, the Klansman dog um, of sporting fields. I mean, he was way ahead of his time. He could still win today. Um, you know, Bob did most of the showing on him. And he was the record holder until Starlein Chanel broke it. And then re more recently, the new Wibbit Dutch um, that's busted the record by quite a lot. Um, Greyhounds, there was a, a bitch in England that I would have given my eye tooth and right arm to show. Her name was Royal Portrait. She belonged to Ralph Parsons. Um, she was one of the finest hounds in any breed I have ever had the joy to put my hands on. She was as smooth as glass. Um, Queenie was very similar to her. That bitch walked into my ring at an open show, a hound show. Um, I was asked to judge. It was a three-day event. And I've got to tell you, I almost cried when I saw her. Wow. She was so beautiful and so good on her legs and just all greyhound all day long. Ralph was a great breeder of greyhounds, but that's one of the finest hounds I have ever seen. I definitely would have. That's probably one of my top, top five. That's exciting. She was to die for. Absolutely. Um, what about advice? Do you have any advice for young handlers that want to become handlers? Yes. Work for someone um, that you admire, respect. Um, don't just jump into what I like calling the dog jockey thing with a nice truck and a nice St. John suit, you know, actually learn something before you get into it, come out of juniors and work hard and read your standards, join a club, join a kennel club, you know, help out at kennel clubs, um, read the AKC delegates page. You know, know what laws, legislation are going on in this sport. Be active in it. It's not a part-time job. It's not for the faint of heart. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We are responsible for our dogs' lives, for their well-being, for their emotional well-being and their physical well-being. It's a big responsibility. And, you know, work hard, learn, stay open. They never stop learning. You're right. You're right about yeah. it. Yeah. I'm done. I mean, I really believe if I, if I get to the point where the passion goes, I need to stop. Yeah. You know? So I have this question then. If you weren't showing dogs, what would you be doing, Les? Oh, when I was in England, when I was in high school, I actually belonged to the police cadets. Can you believe I thought about being a policewoman? <laughs> That's frightening actually. But I also took a few hours um, in a helicopter to get my pilot's license. And I would have loved to have moved freight in Alaska, believe it or not, in a helicopter. I am hopeless in a plane, but I love helicopters. Maybe we'd see uh, one of those reality TV shows up in Alaska moving. Stuff. Maybe I can rig out a helicopter and just drop into dog shows all over the country. <laughs> 
and you say you you have aspirations to judge them. When when do you plan on? Yes, I, I'm. I fall under the new rule um, where the breed club approves you, um, so I can do specialties. And I've just gotten the 2023 Whippet National. I did know that. Yes. Yeah, I, I was. Exciting. Um, it's it's done on a Volton system by your peers, and I'm really excited and really thrilled. It's a dream of mine come true. Okay. I've done the futurity. Um, at the Whippet National a lot of years ago, Donna and I've done specialties in Arizona, the Eastern Regional, but to do the Whippet National is definitely a crown, you know, I mean, it really is. And when, when is that, 2023? 2023. Um, I don't know where yet because we're off a year because of, of course, the pandemic, yeah. but um, I'm really, really looking forward to that. And I, I'm going to Portland in June to do the Greyhound National with Joan Goldstein. I'm doing the sweepstakes oh. out there. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and then I have a specialty coming up in 2022. So, you know, I'll do my breeds and do some sweepstakes and then think about, you know, when I would like to put in for my real judge's license. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it would be a way to continue on, you know, and hopefully be able to give something back. Oh, no question. And I think that I think it's definitely something you need to do because you you have a lot to offer us. So you need to you need to do that, Wes, because I just enjoy talking to you. I learned so I learned things talking to you at ringside. So I love talking to you. You're you know I find us a lot alike in our our views and the passion for the sports never left us. You know you can get a little jaded on and off or a little burned out, but the passions never left us. That's true. You know, and we have fun together. I have fun. Whatever. Yes. I do. <laughs> and we have fun. We absolutely do, William. <laughs> what do you think of the current judging process? I can't keep up with it, to be honest with you. I wish they'd stop changing the rules. And um, I'm, you know, I think the quality of judging is the worst that it's ever been. And I hope this isn't going to get me into trouble. But I don't think we have the caliber of judges. We've lost a lot of great dog people really? in the past few years. Uh, um, I'm not sure the mentoring system with the AKC or the way they get approved to do breeds when they've absolutely had no knowledge of them whatsoever is the way to do it. I mean, hands-on doesn't exist anymore. That was a really valuable tool. I remember going to the garden with a bunch of whippets with two other breeders with Iva Kilman and Phoebe Jordan Boo and having a room of 20 people that would come up and go over our dogs and you could talk to them. Now the Whippet Club still does do a mentoring program like that after the breed. Um, they take in approved people and they do a hands-on. So I think that that's really important. Um, I mean, I've done paperwork for people I will not approve them if I don't think they put the time in. Um, I think a lot of people will just sign off looking for payback down the road um, on people in your breed. And I mean, there's certain breeds that I'm really passionate about, Greyhounds, Whippet, Scottish Deerhounds. You know, I want to see the judging at the breed level be the best it can be. Sort the show dogs out at the group level and best in show level. Right. But yeah. the, the strength in the judging should be at the breed level. I agree. And I'm, you know, I'm not sure we're taking care of business that way. I'm not taking sure we're taking care of our breeders. Um, you know, there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, valid, like validation for the bred by class for breeders. Um, you know, that's kind of we used to fear that class. Oh, fear. Yeah. Or go and watch it. Try, try to say, I want to take that one. Oh, out. absolutely. <laughs> I know. Um, so I, you know, I'm not sure it's it's quite the right way. But I mean, you know, this past year obviously has been trying for everything, and I think they've just tried to keep everything going the best they can, which has meant loosening up some rules and and things have changed in the sport. We don't have the big breeders we used to. It's true. But I there is a lot of quality dogs out there oh yes but there's a lot of bad dogs out there too yeah well that's unfortunately lots of numbers still so you eat, yeah you're bound to get some good ones and you're bound to get some poor ones it's right the way it goes um yeah. I, I, what am i worried about with the 
with the process. And I'm looking at it from up here. Um, I, at, same as up here. I think we, we miss a lot of people that, that would have been fabulous judges because they don't want to do the process. You know, right. For the process. It's expensive too. It's expensive and time consuming. And, and they've got to stop what they're doing basically and do this. Right. And a lot of people just can't afford it. They just can't do it. Right. Exactly. No. I mean, the seminars down in Orlando, I mean, you would have to go down there. You've got hotel rooms, flights, car, whatever you do. Then you're paying what? $250 a seminar? Yeah. I think that's right. I'm not sure, but I think it's right. about 250. Yeah. yeah that's, and that's, that's and so, then trying to cram as many in, in that period of time as you possibly can with no exposure to people outside of the people you've got in the room with you. You know, <clears throat> I think uh, kennel visits are important, you know, going to a breeder's kennel and going over a lot of different dogs, not getting stuck with a mentor who only wants to explain their type of dog to you. You know, the breed clubs need to be careful who they're given that mentor status to. I agree. They do get they, and it's it, it is misused sometimes, even up here. At, you see it happening. Yeah, because, I see it down here. I mean, at the same time, there probably are equal amounts of really good ones too. Oh yes. I don't want to sound all you know. Oh no, that's not. I don't want mean to be negative. all negative. I don't. I don't want to sound like that because I mean, there are very very capable people in the breeds too. There's oh, no yeah. doubt about it. Um, okay, here's a, let's get back on the more fun side. Then. Okay. <laughs> Any superstitions about showing dogs or what you have to do before you show your dogs? My or? leads. I am obsessive with my leads. I retire a lead with a dog. It'll sometimes take me a year to find the right lead for the right dog. And then that has to be that lead for that dog. <laughs> it has to be. And don't touch it. And don't borrow it. <laughs> See, I have leads I mean, for breeds, not for individual dogs. And it drives me a little crazy. Oh, do you? Like, I have them Miss for Peasley individual lead. dogs. I, I have no idea where Miss P's lead went. I don't know. <laughs> oh, really? I've got my old Ziploc bag with their little name tags, and I have Margos, Winnie's, <laughs> Bogarts, you name it. Ali, the Salukis. I have all their leads. I have and a they bunch get old retired with the that, dogs. I have a bunch of old ones that were probably on a bunch of the dogs I show up. Right. <laughs> I don't <laughs> yeah, and I, I am neurotic about the leads and the tack box. And, and um, I, the other thing is there is I can't stand being late. And it, if I'm late, it'll knock my whole day off and I feel like I've done a bad job. And I don't know if that's superstition or more. It's, you know what I mean? I don't think it's so much that. But I, I definitely have a hang up about my leads. It might be our generation because I hate being late too. So. Oh, I hate being late. And, and when someone's late, and may, like I, I take pride to the point where I'm, look, it's 7.30, I'm here. <laughs> it's right, <laughs> right, exactly. Another one's just like, oh, who cares? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's the laid back <laughs> approach, which doesn't work for me. No, no. Um, what, what, what about some of the favorite dogs you've shown? Oh, that's... That's pretty easy. Sporting Fields Winsome won the Whippet Bitch that I won the national with from the veteran class under Kent Delaney. And I loved Kent with just all my heart. He enjoyed his job so much. Sure he did. enjoyed the dogs. You know, he enjoyed obedience as much as he enjoyed confirmation. Obviously, Thistle Glen Margo, who I won the group at the garden with. Um, and my smooth Saluki bitch, who is, is still oh. the top winning smooth bitch of all time. Actually, the top winning smooth. Ali was a character. Um, Bogart um, for the Browns. I loved Sean Bogart. Um, there's been lots of dogs, um, but I would say that's definitely my top few. Definitely. When he start, kind of started it all, that was the one I had the most success with early on. Win some one. So we've been through your mentors. We've been through what you're planning on doing. We've, we, we've talked about what you advice for young handlers. What would happen now, Les, if you met the 20 year old Leslie, what would you say to her? Behave yourself. <laughs> oh my goodness. And take this more seriously. You're not some kind of artist who, you know, Waiting for the big break. 
I, I should have taken it. I, I should have taken it more business like in the beginning. And definitely I needed to behave myself. <laughs> I'm finally getting that now. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, that's part of you. So it's like. Yes. <laughs> yes. The charm of it all. <laughs> <laughs> so do you still have any goals that you want to accomplish in dogs? Yes, um, I would like to be top breeder in whippets. Um, I'm kind of working on that every year. Um, you know, it's a yearly system and you get credited in the whippet annual. I've had the number one dam, I've had the number one stud dog, and I would like to be top breeder. Um, I also, obviously, I wanted to judge the whippet nationals. I would love to judge the Greyhound nationals and the Scottish Tearhound national. I'm sure you will. Um, I would love to have a number one whippet. I've never, I've had top 20 whippets my whole life over here. I've never had a number one whippet. Really? Wow. I would never have guessed that. No, Bogart was number two. He was top dog, but he was never number one. There's always been a great bitch out. Oh. Always. <laughs> I see. I would you never know? guess that. I would have just assumed you. Yeah. <laughs> no. So. Okay. One last question then, Les, and I won't keep you. With all, with all the time off, I, I know shows have started, but we had lots of time off. What were you doing? What were you doing to keep yourself busy? I had three litters of puppies, which for me, I usually only have a litter every couple of years. Um, one of the litters was a litter of nine, and I got very attached to all of them from spending no. so much time with them. I didn't want to let them go. I became a total pet person. Um <laughs> So I really enjoyed the breeding aspect and being able to stay at home with them, not have the schedule we run and leave them in somebody else's care and trying to clean up paperwork. I'm terrible with paperwork. Still, I'm terrible with paperwork. Oh, I can't deal with it. You should see my desk around me right now. <laughs> I, I, get, I get a headache from staring at screens. I do too. Absolutely. But yeah, I would say the best things was being to stay at home with my puppies. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time, Liz. And um, I hope to see you soon. I don't know what I'll I hope to see now. you soon. Uh, yes. Maybe open me to a garden. Who knows, right? Yes. Hopefully you guys will be able to come down and do that. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Keep our fingers crossed. Yep. Okay, so, Len. Well, thank well, you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you, Will. And never stop, William. Never I stop. stop. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. That was a great interview. If you like what you're seeing, seeing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. If you want to get a hold of me, get a hold of me at dogshowtips at gmail.com. Or if you just want to find out what's happening in Will's world, go to willalexander.net. All right, until next week, stay safe out there. <laughs>